In Peru, fishing isn't just a part of the economy, it is the economy. And these days, squid is king. In 2019, it brought around $500 million to the economy, and everyone wants in on the game. From the local artisanal fishermen to the big international players, from the local processors to the politicians. On the other side of this equation are the environmental groups and government officials who should make sure everyone plays by the rules. Rules that we should note are pretty lax to begin with. So good luck trying to enforce them. Horrible. Horrible. Casi me mata. Horrible. Horrible. It almost killed me, really. They made up songs about me. They burned an effigy of me in Paita. It was horrible. So intense. This is The Catch a six-part series about squid produced by Foreign Policy in partnership with the Walton Family Foundation. In each episode, we're following squid from the sea to the plate and along the way, asking questions about sustainability, global economics, the supply chain, and what it takes to curb illegal fishing. I'm Bruxandra Guidi. In our first episode, I flew down to Peru and went along with Lima Bay's reporter, Simeon Tegel, to the fishing town of Paita, there, we learned what's happening out in the water. Basically, that squid seems to be plentiful, but it's probably being overfished. We saw how local fishermen are competing with international fleets that are just outside their sovereign waters. And then went to the processing plants to see how squid is changing the local economy. Today, we bring you part three, who's in charge? We head back to Lima, the country's capital, there, we'll meet the people whose actions will help determine the future of the squid stock in Peru and the health of the overall species. But as we've heard already, keeping an eye on who's doing the fishing can be a very big undertaking. One prime example, what happened a few years back with one of the largest fishing busts in the world. Una grave denuncia. Un buque factoría... Fue la embajada de Estados Unidos en Perú la que advirtió sobre la llegada de una flota con más de 300 barcos. Recurso marítimo a China. It's the middle of the night, May 30th, 2018. A huge blue and white ship is docked in Chimbote Bay along the Pacific, about 270 miles north of Lima. Ok, este, este buque, este buque que antiguamente se llamaba Lafayette, this is Coast Guard Captain Jesus Menacho, one of the top officials tasked with policing Peru's shores. The ship used to be called Lafayette, he tells us, but most recently it had been known as the Damansai Hao, and it carried a Chinese flag. This ship got to Peru in 2014. It had been on a blacklist of vessels that engage in illegal fishing, Captain Menacho says. The Damansai Hao had been the largest fish factory vessel in the world, 750 feet long, capable of processing up to 550,000 tons of fish per year. But on this night in May, a team of agents from the Peruvian Environmental Prosecutor's Office boarded the ship as part of a federal criminal investigation on illegal fishing. It was given a big fine by the Peruvian government, but it appealed and got away with paying $1.5 million, just a fourth of the original fine. Like the Demansai Hao, there are believed to be hundreds of other vessels violating national and international law, engaging in illegal, unreported, and unregulated, or what's commonly known as IUU fishing. And so, while catching the Demansai Hao was a big victory for Peruvian officials, Battling this kind of fishing remains a major issue. IUU fishing is more than a crime. The UN Food and Agriculture Organization says illegal fishing is an industry worth around $23 billion a year. It harms ecosystems, economic growth, food security. It's an underworld of criminal activity. Whether it's fishermen who catch without permits or who catch more than they should, to seafood processing plants that buy from these people, and the middlemen who trade in illegal, unreported, and unregulated, or IUU, fishing. And down here in Peru, the main agency tasked with policing IUU fishing is the Coast Guard. So I'm back in the field with reporter and British expat Simeon Tegel, 
my local guide on my trip to Peru. And he and I are taking a taxi along the Costa Verde in Lima, the coastal freeway, all the way to the sprawling Navy and Coast Guard compound at the far end of the city. Captain Menacho from the Coast Guard hands us some business cards. Behind him, we can see a whiteboard with a list of communities that have been affected by the most recent oil spill in Peru, just north of Lima. The Coast Guard is coordinating the cleanup. And as soon as we start our interview, he brings up the Chinese vessels looking for squid off Peruvian waters, the ones everyone has been telling us about. We have many ways of preventing foreign fleets from other countries from entering our territory, Captain Menacho tells us. We go out on regular maritime patrols. We have also carried out air patrols with the Peruvian Navy and with submarines. And sometimes we travel outside the 200 miles on the high seas, just to move among the fleets to make sure our presence is felt, so they know we're vigilant. But it's hard to imagine just how showing up will deter some of these huge industrial vessels from entering Peru's 200-mile maritime territory. Just because these vessels are there doesn't mean they're acting out of turn. I was curious about this relationship between Peru and these large international vessels. Does Peru discourage them in certain ways? Will they refuse to help them out if they are in need of repairs or other services? I asked Captain Menacho about this. That's right. If those vessels are not in a blacklist, he says, if they're not engaged in illegal fishing like the Daman Saihao was, then we have to assume they're following international laws. And so we do allow them into our territory to get repairs or fuel. That also helps our economy. Plus, we have bigger threats out there, he says. We see other crimes, Captain Menacho says. We face armed robberies at the ports and drug traffickers. They're always looking for new ways to fool us. They will hide their drug shipments on ships and even on submarines. I'll show you one when we go outside. So after our interview, Captain Menacho takes us to see a sleek gray fiberglass motorboat that sits atop a cement platform. It's actually a submersible that was confiscated a couple of years ago by the Peruvian Coast Guard, containing drugs that were headed for the U.S. These sorts of seizures dominate the headlines in Peru year after year. There's one particularly eye-popping one that stands out for me. It's a case from 2017. The owner of a seafood exporting plant, who was also the son of two former Peruvian ministers, he was charged as an accomplice in drug trafficking. One of his exporting ships was found taking a ton of cocaine to Belgium in the U.S., and the shipment was camouflaged as frozen squid. In the end, the businessman was cleared of the charges. Criminal networks are vast, interconnected, and insidious. And yet illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing often goes under the radar. As we traveled around, whenever we broached this subject, there didn't seem to be much concern about illegal fishing in Peru. And beyond Peru, most of us may not care that much about illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, perhaps because the stakes aren't clearly spelled out, or because we don't know enough about these marine resources. So we wanted to get a better sense of the numbers, research that can clearly show the state of the squid population off the coast of Peru, and whether or not they are being overfished. To get a better sense of that, Simeon and I met one of Peru's top state scientists. This is Carlos Martín Salazar with the Instituto del Mar de Peru. I love the sound of it. Peru's Institute of the Sea, a state research institution also known as IMARPE. Carlos coordinates IMARPE's coastal lab in Paita, 600 miles north of Lima. He opens his laptop and projects a slide onto the wall. Uh, un documento oficial. It's an official-looking document from exactly a year ago titled Situación del Calamar Gigante durante el 2020 y perspectivas de captura para el 2021. Giant squid status in 2020 and its prospects for 2021. 
It's a survey of the sustainability of squid in Peru. Using satellite technology data collected at ports and simulation models, Imarpe took a look at the squid stock and found that there's great variability in its numbers. Their biomass, or the total weight of a given species in one area at a specific time, it grew from 2002 until 2011. Over the next few years, that biomass went up and down, up and down, and then in 2015, there was a dramatic drop. That's still the case. It's the most current data. This means that not only are there now fewer squid off the coast of Peru, but the animals seem to be getting smaller in size too. But just as importantly, Imarpe's research says that squid is already overfished along the Peruvian coast. Last year, Imarpe recommended fishing no more than 580,000 tons of squid. This year, that quota is down to 500,000. It's hard to know how much squid is being extracted. The animals' guts are often removed while the ships are still out at sea, bringing down their weight by 10 or 15 percent. This tells us that whatever is getting to the dock is probably only a part of what was caught. Luego, aquí en Parita, en la región Piura, here in Paita, and in this wider coastal region, Salazar says, we catch roughly 45 to 50 percent of the world's squid. So it's fair to say the research findings he's showing us are hugely important to this fishery. Simeon and I look a bit confused. Shouldn't this be setting off alarm bells? Why are there no calls for stricter fishing quotas or tighter enforcement? Salazar explains, while this research is worrisome, it is not conclusive, Salazar says. Imarpe has to do genomic research, so scientists here can understand the variation within the different species of squid they're finding. Squid live a very short life, one to two years. But, he tells us, we don't know exactly what's causing their numbers to fluctuate from one year to the next so wildly. Could it be overfishing, climactic factors, biological changes, pollution? As they say, we don't know what we don't know. There's a lot on the line when it comes to declaring a fishing population unsustainable, ecological collapse, billions of dollars may be lost, livelihoods upended. And so there's a lot of pressure to get the numbers right. And getting the numbers right costs money, money which Imarpe simply lacks. In an ideal world, the state research institution would have more than two research vessels regularly monitoring fishing practices off the coast and gathering data. And there would be Marpe observers always out at the docks and aboard fishing vessels. Right now, they only have the capacity to monitor industrial fleets, and so artisanal boats are left unchecked. But despite pleas to the government, the institution remains severely underfunded. I have to wonder, shouldn't Imarpe's initial findings be causing some concern out on the water? Salazar surprises us when he admits that Imarpe should be doing more in this area. Perhaps we're failing to share our findings and recommendations to fishermen. We're not communicating signs in a way that makes sense to them. And that seems so key to me. I ask Salazar, what would you tell fishermen about catching squid more sustainably? I'd tell them to catch less and get paid more, he says. They need to have more diversity in their catch, in their process, in the markets they sell to. But how? Who decides what a fisherman gets paid? And how can they diversify their catch if they can only find so many species? Salazar seems almost as puzzled as we are. Us Peruvians, he tells us, we don't know how to manage abundance. So if the Coast Guard is not prioritizing fishing crimes and the top scientists are not doing their fair share in pointing out potential threats to squid, is anyone trying to change the status quo? Or is the squid population's fate doomed to be the same as anchovies, which created a boom economy until overfishing decimated the species? We know just the person to ask. It's a sunny and pleasant morning back in Lima. Simeon and I are in San Isidro, one of the city's ritziest neighborhoods. 
The streets are lined with trees here and flowering plants with none of the crazy traffic you'll find elsewhere in town. Hola, soy, uh, somos Simeon Tejeli, Roxana Guidi. Los We've come to see Patricia Majluf, one of the most well-known biologists and conservationists in Peru. Today, she's a senior scientist with the global NGO Oceana, where economist Juan Carlos Suedo also works. Patricia grew up here in Lima, a few blocks from the ocean, with parents who encouraged her early on to pursue her passion for science. Her doctorate studies took her to San Juan Marcona, a fishing town eight hours south of Lima, where she began to focus on sea lions. That's where I began to see how the physical features of a beach shape the behavior of the animals that live there, she tells us. If you change the features of a place, that influences the animals too. And so that's where I stayed, she says. Sea lions' behavior is unfortunately determined by oceanographic changes because they feed on anchovy. And year to year, depending on whether it's a good or a bad year, the female sea lions spend more or less time with their pups. If it's a good year with lots of fish, they can leave them after just six months. If not, they have to keep feeding them for up to four years. After many years of doing the study, Mahluf witnessed a dramatic change. It was 1997, during one of those bad El Niño years. The anchovy fishery collapsed, and the sea lion population she'd been studying now for 20 years collapsed too. All the sea lions she'd been tracking in San Juan Marcona died. So that's how Mahluf found herself studying fish, anchovy in particular. Anchovy, by the way, is the largest single species fishery in the world, by weight. Mahluf briefly served as vice president of the board of Imarpe, the state research institution. And then she got into government, as Vice Minister of Fisheries in 2012. In this role, she was thrust into the spotlight where any perceived threat to fishing profits was met with great resistance by the fishing industry. It was horrible, she tells us. It almost killed me, really. They made up songs about me. They burned an effigy of me in Baita. It was horrible, so intense. Simeon says, what fishermen told me is that you're anti-fishing. Sure, that's what they think, says Mahluf. What they don't know is that I want there to be fishing, so Peruvians can eat more and better. So I'm not anti-fishing. I'm pro-sustainable fishing. Mahluf says that she was totally naive as a scientist getting into politics. She barely lasted in the position, just two months and four days. Her resignation letter said she was quitting due to, quote, discrepancy and dissatisfaction about the management of the fishing sector. She made a point to call out the corruption, ineptitude and disregard on her way out the door. She says it permeated the whole production ministry where interest groups had way more power than lawmakers. The fishing industry, the plants that process the fish to make fish meal or freeze it and export it, they pay for the election campaigns for all politicians in Peru, Mahluf says. Is it the most important lobby in Peru? It's one of them. In the years of the Alejandro Toledo presidency, from 2001 till 2006, Mahluf says, there were four ministers who were fishing impresarios. Working in that ministry, she tells us, you either joined the gang or you did absolutely nothing. After leaving government, Mahluf vowed to earnestly do conservation and advocacy on behalf of the oceans and its species. She since founded the Center for Environmental Sustainability at the Cayetano Heredia University in Lima. She's become an outspoken champion of the sustainable seafood movement, working with Peruvian chefs and restaurants to create awareness. And when she can, Mahluf follows the changes in the sea lion population in San Juan Marcona, 
that first drew her to fisheries. Today, her former students are the ones keeping up with that research. Of course, she tells us. It's easier to stop fighting and dedicate yourself to something else. But if you keep fighting, there is this tiny, tiny, but really tiny possibility that you'll achieve change. If you don't, well, that possibility just vanishes. Simeon's been trying to get us someone from the current government who can speak about fisheries. Ah, hola, Virginia. ¿Qué tal? ¿Cómo está? Sí, sospechaba que era. Sí. He's calling the Ministry of Production, the Vice Ministry of Fisheries, where Mahlouf was at briefly, the Environment Ministry, the regional government, where Paita is located. We get no reply. So we broaden out our search and reach out to Kalamazur, which stands for the Committee for the Sustainable Management of the Southern Pacific Jumbo Flying Squid. It's a mouthful. Kalamazur operates outside of the Peruvian government. It's a regional body that brings together countries in this hemisphere where squid is fished. Peru, Ecuador, Mexico, and Chile. It doesn't have the power to enforce penalties, but it does create alliances and advocates as a unified voice. Its current president is Alfonso Miranda, an entrepreneur and consultant for the fishing industry. Like Patricia Mahlouf, he too was once Peru's vice minister of fisheries, though he was in office far longer, serving five years, until 2009. And also like Mahlouf, Miranda is frustrated by what he sees as a lackadaisical approach to enforcement. Peru does not have a real environmental policy, Miranda tells us. It may say on paper that it's protecting its coastlines, that it's creating maritime protected areas, but that's only on paper, he says. I dare you to go and fish at will, throw dynamite, whatever. No one's going to watch you or bother you. Peru's policies that regulate fisheries are lazy. They aren't enforced. Miranda is completely frustrated by the apathy at all levels of the Peruvian government. We keep trying to speak to current government officials, but no one calls us back. We keep asking about squid, but the current administration is embroiled in so many political dramas, bigger, much bigger than this one species. Squid seems to be the least of its concerns. Meanwhile, squid fishing employs more than 20,000 people in Peru, and squid processing and export employs the most people of all fisheries in Peru, all of these players are betting that squid will keep bringing in money. Sadly, though, Peru has a long history of mismanaging or exhausting profit-making natural resources to the brink. Guano, or fertilizer made out of seabird poop, until the end of the 19th century, rubber around the early 20th century, and anchovy, which disappeared at one point in the 1970s prompting conservationist Patricia Mahlouf to get into this field. Like guano and anchovy before it, squid is the new hen with the golden eggs, a resource that keeps on giving. But until when? Next time on The Catch. We leave Peru and broaden our gaze on the current state of global fishing. We'll follow the bad actors who abuse their crews and fish illegally, and talk to those who patrol and monitor the high seas. There's no point in having laws if, if the laws aren't going to be enforced. That's next time on The Catch. And that's it for part three of The Catch. Our show is a production of Foreign Policy in partnership with the Walton Family Foundation. Our production team includes Jimena Letgar, Rosie Julen, Rob Sachs, Maria Jimena Aragon, and Anissa Peseshki. Special thanks to my co-reporter, Simeon Tegel, based in Lima. A big thanks to Teresa Ish, Renu Mittal, and Mark Shields from the Walton Family Foundation for their assistance. If you like what you're hearing, please consider leaving a review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Or head over to foreignpolicy.com, where you can listen to our other podcasts and sign up for our newsletter. The Catch is made possible in part by the support of foreign policy readers. If you're interested in smart geopolitical news and analysis from Washington and around the world, please consider subscribing. 
The Catch listeners can get a 15% discount on their first month or year of access by going to foreignpolicy.com slash subscribe and using the promo code SQUID, S-Q-U-I-D, at checkout. Thanks for listening. I'm Ruxandra Guidi. See you next week.